This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this video series on thermal unit operations. We are still in the section on general considerations and step constructions and today I would like to show various options for top and bottom situations in rectification columns. Before we focus on these different options that exist, let us look back at those things that we found. Uh, we realized that the flow rate compositions in that we find in the counter current process can be represented by such an operating line. So whenever two flow rates meet somewhere in the counter current process, their compositions have to lie on this operating line. The operating line has the slope L dot over G dot. Always at that point, so to speak, of the process where we set up, for which we set up the balance. And the top and bottom we realize of such a section of an operating line corresponds to those flow rates entering and leaving at the top and at the bottom of the corresponding uh, section that we regard. So there is a one-to-one -one relation between the compositions of compositions uh, of the compositions of the streams that meet in a uh, countercurrent process and a point on this line, and the slope always has to correspond to that slope in the column. Of course, we know the lever rule and all these things. We leave that aside today. Secondly, we want to look at typical cases that we realize. We realize that for intermediate heating or cooling that the operating lines have to meet on the diagonal. If there is a side withdrawal, there is a kink in the operating lines and if we have an arbitrary feed, that can be realized by the Q-line construction that we have developed in more detail previously. And now we want to apply these very general findings to the specific situations that we have for the top and the bottom, the reboiler and the condenser of a distillation column. So let's first start with those things that we know already. Let's start with a typical condenser. So we have our G dot stream with its composition. It's totally condensed. Part of that is withdrawn. So here we are with the liquid at a boiling point. We withdraw our distillate side stream and feed the remainder, our reflux, back into the column. So that reflux will then create the L dot. Of course, the compositions up here will all be identical. They will be all XT, which means also that this X and that Y are identical, which means we have a point on the diagonal. At the same time, if we look now more carefully, we realize that we have an intermediate cooling, which means Operating lines have to mean meet on the diagonal. Above we have um, above our side withdrawal, our distillate withdrawal, we have an L dot over G dot, which is one. This flow rate is the same as that because there's nothing removed in between. So that is exactly one. It's on the diagonal, but that's actually irrelevant. We will see that in just a moment. And below that side withdrawal, we have a different flow rate ratio which is not equal to 1, so the ratio is not uh, equal to 1 anymore, which of course corresponds to the internal flow rate ratio in our distillation column. And we realize that the change happens exactly at that point where we remove this side withdrawal, so at XD. So at XD there is a kink in the operating line from this slope to that slope. And if you plot that, we see it like here, we see, see it in this slide, so below we know the construction already, but actually virtually, so to speak, above we would have an operating line lying on the diagonal. There is a kink on the diagonal at XD, exactly there, which leads then to this operating line below, which now has the flow rate ratio L dot or the slope of the flow rate ratio L dot over G dot. If you evaluate that with the V, with the reflux ratio, this is reflux ratio divided by reflux ratio plus one. And if you evaluate that, if you plot that line, you find that the intersection with the y-axis is exactly at XD over V plus one. At that point, one can also say more explicitly that this defines, so to speak, the internal reflux ratio, how it is sometimes called, and this, 
to contrast that is then called the external reflux ratio. So this V is the external and the L dot of the G dot the internal reflux ratio. Everything is fine, so diagonal above at xt a kink with the new slope below which corresponds to the L dot over G dot which you find in the rectifying section of the column. Everything fine. Now of course we want to step further. The next case we want to regard is a partial condenser. A partial condenser is typically drawn like that. So you have your first or the topmost theoretical stage in the distillation column. On top of that you have your condenser and from the condenser you remove partially your vapor. The rest is condensed to the yield the reflux. The reflux is obtained at dew point condition, uh, at boiling point condition, so it's a liquid at boiling point condition, and this actually is removed at dew point. So actually this means there is an equilibrium taking place inside this condenser, this partial condenser, and you have, so to speak, two equilibrium phases that are leaving. So that way allows you, or realizing that, you, it allows you to redraw that and regard that as one theoretical stage where you now have your vapor being removed with the composition Yd and the reflux being exactly this, uh, uh, having that composition, the liquid equilibrium con uh, condition equilibrium with this distillate stream. So here you have exactly that situation. So this is just redrawn what we actually have here. So this doesn't spell out that you have a theoretical stage here, which is explicitly mentioned on that side. And now we can again look at the different positions here and ha have a look at the flow rate ratios and the compositions. Now, what do we have? Above we have a D dot, no, so it's a vapor stream in that case, vapor is being removed. And uh, you have an L dot over G dot of course in that case, L dot is zero, so L dot over G dot is zero, which means the operating line is horizontal, slope being zero. Then we have an intermediate cooling, which means the operating lines above and below have to meet on the diagonal and they have to meet at that composition where that occurs and that's actually exactly this yd, the, the composition that we are removing here. Since we typically called it xd before, we keep that so to speak as a definition of the flow rate but actually it's a yd that is being removed. So the operating line here and there have to meet on the diagonal because it's, it's an intermediate cooling. And here, of course, we again have the L dot over G dot, which is not equal to 1, which is defined again by the reflux ratio that we define here with the R dot and the G dot, or actually the R dot and D dot, but that relates, of course, to the D, uh, G dot just by a balance. So that L dot over G dot is not equal to 1. It corresponds to that internal flow rate ratio, which we find in the... Um, rectifying section of the column. So if we look at that, what do we have? At yd we have a horizontal operating line above. Below the uh, condenser we have another operating line with a different slope, but both have to meet at the composition at that yd on the diagonal. Well, they automatically do that, so that's the yd and so that corresponds to the yd uh, to do the xd so to speak they have to meet on the diagonal as they do here and below we then have our typical operating line where we know everything already the flow rate ratio we know the intersection with the y-axis now here spelled out also with the yd and now of course we have one theoretical stage so to speak for free on top of everything which is now our partial condenser so our partial condenser represents one theoretical stage and it's exactly the same as, as we have seen previously for the, when we discussed distillation in general, for also with the McCaptiel diagram with this specific application. Um, we said for a partial reboiler we have one theoretical stage for free and here's the same for the partial condenser, we have one theoretical stage for free. And since the condensation takes place if you have a heat exchanger in, your, in the top of the column, you will produce more or less exactly a vapor in equilibrium and a liquid in equilibrium. So you get really more or less one theoretical stage indeed for free. Of course this only makes sense if your product can be a vapor stream. Yeah, so if you, especially if you would have for your next process step a vapor or some superheated vapor possibly, you would very much like to have here a vapor already, not need to evaporate in a liquid again, so 
possibly you, in that case you would regard a partial condenser as the optimal solution for your process. And in that case you get this uh, theoretical stage for free, which is now co counting as zero to be consistent with our pre uh, previous nomenclature. So in this nomenclature step, uh, theoretical stage one is the first that we realize with the internals in the column of our distillation column and the zero is our partial condenser. Okay, so there we see that we have a total and a partial condenser as option partial condenser realizing one additional theoretical stage, otherwise everything is more or less identical. Now let's have a look at the reboilers and there we realize as well that we have typically this partial condenser, so that's a typical situation that you have a big tank, so to speak, which is your reboiler, where you directly introduce your heat exchanger and you evaporate, so to speak, the G dot prime from that liquid in that uh, reboiler. You remove at the same time your bottom product as a liquid stream and that's so that's a typical situation. And that's of course partial reboiler because that corresponds, as we have regarded it previously, as one theoretical stage. But in principle also here you can have a total reboiler, which means you have one theoretical stage, which is now the bottom part, the bottom section or corresponding to the bottom section of your distillation column. You have a liquid, you remove part of the liquid and the remaining liquid is completely evaporated to, to a vapor at dew point. So this is liquid at boiling point, this is vapor at dew point. And so the remaining liquid after removal of the B dot is then evaporated compute completely into its dew point state. No composition change here because there is no equilibrium involved, only the flow rates change. And now we can try to represent that as well in the corresponding uh, yx diagram. Before that I should say if you have a specific situation of your reboiler in your special column you have to carefully consider if it is this case or that case because here as we will see again or as we know we get this theoretical stage for free. This is actually the last if it's really this clearly this state then this is typically the bottom part of the distillation column in principle but often you have mixes so to speak. You have a separated, uh, separate evaporator, then you feed it back into a reboiler vessel, so there you mix that again, and that often corresponds then more or less to that. So it looks like that, but actually it's that. So one has to be quite careful how that is really operated. If you really produce your vapor, so to speak, separately and in introduce it into the distillation column, or if you mix that in a big tank with your liquid again, that distinguishes that in reality to a certain extent. Now let's have a look how that looks like, it's shown here. So here we have our last theoretical stage on the distillation column. Here we have some arbitrary flow rate ratio, L dot prime over D dot prime, which corresponds to the corresponding flow rate ratio in our stripping section. Then we have our side stream removal, meaning that here and there, there is a kink in the operating line. The composition down here is always XB, so there is a kink in XB and below we know the flow rate ratio is 1, we are again on the diagonal. Then there is some intermediate heating, but that's more or less irrelevant. That would mean that the operating lines below, there is none, uh, they, they would meet, so to speak, on the diagonal, but we are on the diagonal anyway, so that doesn't change anything. So here we are on the diagonal. Uh, on the diagonal, at XB we remove this, we have the kink towards the flow rate ratio above with, uh, leading to the corresponding slope. If you plot that it looks like that. So below we have the operating line on the diagonal but it's irrelevant because we have a kink at xp so that above that we have the flow rate ratio L dot prime over D dot prime which is the corresponding flow rate ratio in the corresponding section of the column. And the kink occurs indeed at xp so that looks more or less exactly as we had it before. And again we have the same situation as with a reboiler if it's a partial, uh, with a partial condenser. If it's a partial reboiler it's like with a partial condenser. We get one theoretical stage for free. We discussed that already when we discussed distillation in the mccab diagram. If we have total con uh, evaporation, so, so a total co uh, a reboiler, in that case you would not get that for free. Then actually our reboiler would just be that point and that would already be our first theoretical stage which has to be realized in the distillation column. So it's the same situation for the condenser and the reboiler actually. Okay, so that's how it looks like and how we can represent that. Now there are more complex things around or it's actually not 
too much complex, but other things around that you can realize for the reboiler. In principle, many other things for the condenser are possible as well. One can think about those, so to speak, and it will be trivial more or less, or more or less straightforward to apply those things based on these very general considerations. One thing we want to look at is the situation that we have a reboiler where we introduce actually a steam into our distillation column. Well, that is realized especially if you have an aqueous system, which already contains water, so you can add water steam to the system without introducing a new component. And secondly, you realize that in chemical industry, very often heat is being transported uh, by steam, superheated steam typically, which is available at different pressure levels, two bars, four bars, whatever. Uh, so you have heat transport in the plant, in a chemical industry plant by steam. So the steam is available as your heat transfer medium anyway. So why do you want to lose, so to speak, efficiency via introducing a heat exchanger? Why don't you use the steam directly, inject it into the column? Now before we go to the superheated steam, let's first have a look at the saturated vapor. So let's assume that we have saturated steam. But in that case, we introduce an S dot, which is our saturated steam. This is, so to speak, then in that case at dew point. This G dot prime is at dew point. This is at boiling point and this B dot is at boiling point as well. And now one can realize that actually that situation leads to the following, which is actually shown here, that this L dot prime has to be the B dot. And this is the only dew point stream that is added, so the G dot prime has to correspond to that. The reason for that is the assumption of um, equimolar evaporation and condensation, which leads to the situation that the only dew point stream entering is here, so that can only be the same flow rate here as we have here, which in consequence means that has to be the same as that, and you can represent it like that. This now, of course, only refers to the flow rates. There is some exchange in between with respect to composition, possibly. Yeah, but it just means there is no net, so to speak, liquid trans evaporated and no vapor condensed. It's exchanged that occurs on the, uh, in, in the reboiler, but on the other hand, so there's material exchange, but the flow rates, so to speak, the overall flow rates, they are remaining constant across that reboiler situation. And now we can look at what we have here. So what do we have here? We have the B dot over S dot down here. We have an L dot prime over, so we know this already, it's a G dot prime over L dot prime, a slope. And that has to be the same as below, because here nothing changes and here nothing changes. So that flow rate is the same as that. And it will happen at XB, this is defining our composition here. And here I actually use a general case not pure water, but I assume that that water can contain a little bit of those components which is separated here as well, so binary system, so this is water plus something and the something is the same as here and this contains still a little bit of something. It can be zero, so the Y1, a Yi can be zero, but to generalize it a little bit, let's look at the Yi and then of course we know well the compositions here are just Yi xb or xb Yi, so that are the coordinates of the point that corresponds to that and we know that we have a flow rate ratio here which is the same as there which runs through that point. If you plot that we have this point xb y1 and we have the slope l dot prime over g dot prime which corresponds now exactly to so the g dot prime corresponds to the flow rate of the saturated steam that we added we know that the l dot prime is coming from the top so we know everything so to speak that we can plot that line and as i said if it's a pure steam then the yi can be zero which would mean that our point would be on the x-axis no problem with that so that the point would be starting from the x-axis. Not from the diagonal as previously, but from the x-axis. Now we come to the next step, next complication if you like, that we use superheated steam. Superheated steam, how does that look like? Well, let's have a look. So if this is superheated steam, what does that mean? It means actually if we tilt that diagram a little bit, it looks like that. We have our bottom product, it shall be a liquid, we have a liquid over here, we have a G dot prime to the top and L dot prime coming from the top or from above. We have our superheated steam. Ah, and we know that. We know that we have a, what happens if you have a superheated feed. It's just a feed with a certain composition, just like that. 
So we can regard that as a superheated feed and we know that now a certain q times s dot is added to the L dot prime and a 1 minus q s dot is added to the vapor stream. So what does that mean? If it is superheated, in that case, of course, a certain amount of this L dot prime is getting evaporated additionally by that, which means, if you remember correctly, it means the Q is negative. The Q was defining in distillation that energy that you need to transform your um, feed into saturated vapor divided by the enthalpy of evaporation. Which means now, since it's superheated, you have to cool it down. It's a negative energy that you need to supply to transfer it, it to a vapor at U point. So it's negative divided by the enthalpy of evaporation, which is, is a positive value, so our Q is negative. Which means, actually, a certain amount of the L dot prime is getting additionally evaporated and add to the, added to the G dot prime. And we know how to plot that actually. We can look at that again. So, well, we can formally say, well, here we have an L dot over G dot, no vapor flow rate, G dot is zero, which means this is infinity, it's a vertical line at XB, we know that. So this corresponds at XB to a vertical operating line. And then we have a feed with a Q which is less than zero, which leads to a Q line. And we know if there is a composition YI here, we know how to plot it. Well, how does it look like? Well, on the one hand side, we have at XB our vertical line. That corresponds to the operating, operating line below. That's irrelevant because there are no, no theoretical stages anymore, but nevertheless, we have that. And then we know that we feed actually at YI with a negative Q. And we know how to plot that. We know that actually this is now uh, the Y. It's pretty small, right? Anyway, we have our at YI on the diagonal is one point of the Q line and the second point is as YI divided by Q. And that leads of course to uh, the second point and then we connect these two points to give this Q line, this intersection line, that intersects with the operating line below at this point. So we know at this point actually this L dot prime over G dot prime is starting. Now in principle of course we know we, we can also plot this of course, in the case that our stupid superheated steam is pure water, then we know the composition and the yi divided by q has to lie in the origin. Then that point is defined. And the slope is, again, q divided by q minus 1, which is lying like this. So we, in that point, we start out from the origin and have our q line somewhere here, which then intersects with the vertical above xb. And that would then be the starting point for the operating uh, line in in the stripping section of the column. So we are able to plot that and also for the case of yi being zero, we can still plot it with the help of the slope when we know the q, when we know how much superheated our steam actually is. So in that case we are also able to plot it. So we have seen now total condenser, partial condenser, total reboiler, partial reboiler, heating with saturated steam and with superheated steam, all of that is possible. Again, the, also this, of course, only makes sense if water, or mostly sense if water is already in the system. Of course, you can apply it also in other systems if you like. But then you would typically be in more uh, in internary systems, so that cannot be represented that in that easy way. But possibly you may think of that also in other other cases. Typically, it's all with aqueous systems. Okay. So we know this, all these situations, we're able to plot them and we see that we can apply these very general things over and over again. That any point where two streams meet in a countercurrent process can be represented by a point on, on operating lines. The different situations that occur, withdrawals lead to a kink, heating and cooling lead to a meeting on the diagonal, all these things are realized and the slope is always the local L dot over G dot represented in the different sections of the column. So that way it works quite fine. So we can summarize that. The slope of the operating line is always L dot over G dot and the operating line connects all possible XY combinations that can meet in the countercurrent process. And based on these uh, previous cases that we have regarded, a variety of top and bottom configurations in rectification can be handled. So we are now equipped or you are equipped to 
deal with all these cases that can possibly occur. With that I would like to say thank you for this video and I hope to see you again.